internet thing? Do you want to talk about the, how you got here? Yeah, yeah let, let me tell you uh, my saga of my internet service provider, I guess. Not really, not the provider. So we had a huge storm where I live. It was, like, I say huge. It really wasn't that bad. It was just really windy and a lot of water. Um, we Like, we there's just no damage to our property, so who cares? And, like, the internet goes out. Okay, that happens. Whatever. So we call the, the, the our ISP and was like, hey, what's uh, what's up? And we get, you know, the automated message. Like, oh, because it was like 7 at the time. Oh, we'll be back at 8.30. Like, oh, an hour, 30 minutes. Oh, no, my life's over. <laughs> we Like, we, we, you know, we just piddle around. And um, 8.30 comes back around. Then 9. Then 10. We're like, yeah. okay. Yeah, it's getting worse. We call, yeah, we call the thing. We're like, hey, what's up? And the automated message. Our technicians are doing the best they can. I'm like, oh, so that means they don't have any idea. <laughs> yeah, pretty and, much. Uh, so yeah, and um, so we, we also asked them to like call us when the internet was back. Uh, so we were like, okay, I guess we'll get like we're we're gonna go to bed, and we're just gonna get a call in the middle of the night, going, oh, the internet's back. Congratulations, you can do shit now. Um, so we wake up, and there's no missed calls, and there's no internet, and we're like, oh, okay, boy. it's a little strange. And uh, almost, uh, it was a little bit shy of 24 hours later, um, uh, I notice, or no, Michael notices that the internet's just back up. We still haven't gotten a call from the ISP, by the way. Oh, um, no. Yeah, There's it's, no way. <laughs> it's, it's been like about a day since then. But yeah, a whole day for the most part without internet. Um, it, it, here's the thing. It's not like, oh, it's this big fucking deal. It's just like, we're stuck at home with the coronavirus anyway. So like, what the fuck are we supposed to do? Right. Yeah. Yeah, you're not wrong. I mean, it's a weird thing. We're so Wait, unprepared to not be Michael, connected. Michael has come in to correct me. What, Michael? Oh, okay. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, thank uh, so you for A couple hours afterwards, you guys got a call. Yeah, I don't know if that picked up on my mic. But yeah, it's uh, Michael came in just to say... Uh, he, he, he didn't tell me, but we did get a call. It was still a couple hours afterwards. Yeah. So, Here at the Michael and- Jordan podcast, we have journalistic <laughs> integrity. We always get the facts right. It's true. The Michael Jordan. Well, here's the thing. Michael Jordan might have his integrity, but I don't. <laughs> so-, <laughs> <laughs> so in my nameless ISP's defense, they did eventually call us. But anyway. Um, yeah. So I'm not trying to say like, oh, woe is this? We went a day without internet. Just more like. We can't go anywhere. Like, we can't yeah. do anything. We are so used to being in a connected society that we just don't know what to do without the internet. Yeah, and it's like we don't have a TV because we use the internet. Like, where Michael especially, like, streams his music on the internet. Like, it was just a lot of, like, oh, let's do... Oh, we can't. <laughs> I look up recipes on the internet. And, you know, when it, like, it wasn't that bad. We just, like, cleaned the house. It was just kind of like, oh, man, this is inconvenient and like normally when the internet goes out that long we just like go take a walk but we Mm -hmm. can't so right uh (laughs) well you know katie you know who else didn't have the internet oh boy who cowboys Uh, Cowboys. (laughs) (laughs) i mean i think there's probably some cowboys now who have the internet um i'd assume there are people who qualify as cowboys um ranchers and whatnot but Uh Uh, yeah, so we're talking about Red Dead Redemption 2. Um, I guess we probably don't know exactly when this one will come out, but this will be another one of the short episodes. Um, we'll release this when Katie's out on maternity leave, and we talked about a lot of different ideas for what we could do, but Red Dead Redemption 2 is one of those topics that I'm pretty sure I've only talked about in bits and pieces on the podcast Mm -hmm. and the streams, uh, and I've never really kind of sat down to, uh... To Give kinda, it the love. Yeah, dive into it a little bit more. And, like, there's a lot of different areas that we can go for Red Dead Redemption 2. It's a massive game. I could talk about various different themes within the story, various different characters, aspects of it that I think are really good. But I thought, um, because of a comment that I made recently on one of our live streams, that I could sort of expand upon that idea. Mm-hmm. Um, it was on one of the, well... It's not necessarily going to be recent by the time this episode comes back, but if you go back to either first or second Animal Crossing, OG Animal Crossing streams that we did. I think it was actually the third. Oh, is it the third one? It might have been the third, yeah. Okay, so yeah. So <laughs> one of the one of the first ones, I made a comment that Red Dead Redemption 2 is like the notebook for 17-year-old boys. Um, mm-hmm. And I explained it a little bit on the live stream, um, but I just figured I could I could expound upon that idea a little bit more, and that might be fun for a short episode. 
So here we are. So here we are. Uh, so basically, the premise that I had was that when The Notebook came out, of course, The Notebook is a very popular movie. I feel like it doesn't require any explaining. It's got Ryan Gosling and Rachel McAdams in it. It's a very typical, archetypical sort of lo- romance love story and is most notable for the fact that Ryan Gosling's character builds this uh, this young lady a, uh, a house because she wants a house. Wasn't it like he renovated it or something like that? Like the house was already, I, I mean, I don't, I'm being nitpicky at this point, but. <laughs> I'll be real honest with you, Katie. I'm not clear on the details of the notebook because fun fact, <laughs> I have either fallen asleep or ended up having <laughs> sex with someone every single time I've ever had to watch that movie. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you for that piece of information about your life. Did the microphone uh, blast up when I did that too? No, I didn't hear it, but it might have. I was laughing. I think too. I see it on the. So, fun fact: I don't really know how the notebook ends. Really, oh, I kind of know how it starts. Um, I'm, oh. not, I'm not real clear on the plot of the notebook. Uh, to be perfectly honest well, with you. Well, now the 17-year-old guys are going to be like, oh, shit, playing Red is going to get me laid. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, it's it's it, it doesn't bat a thousand, but, you know, it's not a bad percentage. Um, it helps if you know how to cook and you couple it with things like flowers and then these other things, guys. There's, there's more than a one-step process, okay? <laughs> Oh boy, I didn't expect to go there, but that's what happened. Hey, that's on you. I didn't do anything. <laughs> okay, it's a good thing I edit these things also. <laughs> but yeah, no, I I think they like they find an old house and they break it. It's kind of like the, the, the uh, it's a wonderful life premise where they they find an old house that she falls in love with and he renovates it for her or something like that. It's a very romantic story, yeah. and I think that women yeah. really attach themselves to it because <laughs> Because a house is a symbol of permanence, and it's a it's an act of commitment and love, yeah. and it's such a great endeavor. It's beautiful, honestly. I can sit here and be a typical dude bro and go, oh, whatever, and make fun of it. But it's actually kind of a sweet gesture, right? Not yeah. sweet. It's it's a grand gesture, honestly. Oh, yeah, like, especially nowadays when, like, fuck if I can afford a house. Sure, <laughs> right? Like, flowers are a sweet gesture. You build a gala house, that's like, whoa, that's Damn, a big yeah. thing. <laughs> um, but it was, for some reason, like, the notebook has, I mean, I'm even making jokes about it now. It's like, oh, getting laid, what's the notebook, whatever, like, Men sort of saw it as too sappy and also like, Jesus Christ, I have to, you know, men were saying things like, well, now I have to build every girl a house that I go on a date, whatever. Like the, the male response to it was not nearly as positive as a female response, which is fine. It mm-hmm. really was built to be geared towards a female audience, I think, anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, Red Dead Redemption 2. Why do I think that Red Dead Redemption 2 is like the male equivalent or the thing that would motivate or make it cool to want to build a gal house? Okay, so in order to, to understand this theory, basically, huge overarching plot. There's lots of stuff about freedom and the law and then the state and the individual ruggedness, blah, blah, blah. But we got to hone in on some very specific elements to sort of do this in a short amount of time. So in order to understand this, we need to understand John Marston, his wife Abigail, their son Jack, Arthur Morgan, and a woman named Mary Linton. Uh, and this sort of really takes place, I guess, throughout the you know the second and third acts of the game. But more specifically, like the real the real summation of it all comes in the epilogue, which is um, major spoiler alerts for Red Dead Redemption Two. I'm sorry, I'm going to spoil basically the biggest spoiler of the game if you haven't played it. But you kind of have to understand this in order to understand this theory. Sure, Arthur... you didn't even ask me if I wanted. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> What? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Was that yeah. was that the next on your up next list? Yeah, for games? Animal Crossing and Red Dead Redemption. I mean, no, I kidding. honestly think that those two games, that's not a bad idea, but <laughs> as someone who likes both of those games. But go on, sorry. Um, big time spoiler, the biggest spoiler in Red Dead Redemption 2. Cover your ears if you want to play it. Um, Arthur Morgan, the character you play as for the majority of the game, dies. He dies at the end. And then you play in the epilogue as John Marston, who is the person that you actually play as in Red Dead Redemption 1. Because um, Red Dead Redemption 2 is a prequel. Oh, okay. Um, so Arthur Morgan dies. You play as John Marston in the epilogue. Um, so how do I how do I uh, put this into context? I guess we should probably start with Arthur and Mary. Mary Linton is sort of the old flame for Arthur. She's sort of like the one that got away. Um, Arthur Morgan, uh, I don't know if they ever say his age specifically, but he's probably mid to late 30s, which is like an old dog in the in the world of outlaws. Like you have to be really 
you've been doing this a long time to be able to survive that long. Um, and he's been, he's been running with Dutch, uh, Dutch's gang since he was, they, they make it sound like since he was about 15. So like 20 plus years of being an outlaw. Um, he's long in the tooth. He's, he's considered one of the veterans, um, the veteran really. And Mary was someone that he sort of had an on and off relationship with throughout his life. She comes from more like the good side of the tracks, if you want to say, has a proper family, all that sort of a thing. And her family never approved of him and they were in love. And he talked about, you know, he always talked about one last job. I'm going to do one last job and then we're going to run away together. I'll have enough money and we'll be able to do that. But he never did that. Like he never made good on it. And eventually Mary just said, you know what? I can't live like this. I can't live wondering if you're going to come back or not or, or end up in jail or dead. And you're not you're not doing what you say you're going to do. You're not going to leave your life of being an outlaw. You're stringing me along and, and I just can't take that anymore and we're done. Good on Mary. Good on Mary. Exactly yeah. right. Good on Mary. And the beauty of what this game shows is that Arthur knows good on Mary, right? Like when she comes back into your life around like the second act, third act, stuff like that, is she's, you have certain story missions where you help her with certain things. We don't need to go into the details of it, but they reconnect a little bit. Um, and at the climax of that at the climax of that side plot, again, it's like there's several quests that you can go on that to sort of reconnect Arthur and, and Mary. Um, they they don't get back together, and Arthur doesn't leave the gang, and they don't run off together ever. And um, in Arthur's journal, which is partially narrated um, after you do the last one, I don't remember exactly what it says, but it's Arthur sort of reflecting something to the tune of, I know I blew it. I know I messed up and I'm glad that I was able to reconnect with Mary, but I know now what I was never really able to admit to myself before, which is that I'm never going to be able to do it. I'm never going to be able to leave this life. And I'm sad about that. And I wish I could have had a life with Mary, but maybe I'm just not good enough. Maybe I can't. And that makes me sad, but I'm not going to lie to her anymore about that. She knows. And I know I'm never going to leave this life. And that's kind of it. And it's kind of sad but it's also kind of refreshing that the game doesn't put Arthur in some sort of like, you know, his girl left him sort of like, woe is me kind of standpoint. Like at least at the very least, he has the ability to sort of stand up and realize the mistakes he made and own up to it. Yeah, that's a very mature way to look at a relationship that like you don't generally see in video games a lot of the time. Like a lot of the times in like video games, and even like action movies, the reward is I got the woman back, you know? Exactly. No, exactly. Especially a game that, let's be honest, you know, I'm sure there's there's lot. I know lots of women who like Red Dead Redemption 2, but it is a sort of, you know, protagonist is male. It's a very sort of male centric type of game. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I thought that that was very refreshing. But moreover, so that's that's um, Arthur and Mary, like super in a nutshell, like super condensed. But that's basically the arc of what happens there. Um, and Mary Linton stuff ends chapter five or four i can't remember you know like before the last two chapters are like the hellish chapters of rdr2 where everything is just going to shit real Bef quick how many chapters are there to like eight or oh something? you're asking me to seven i think okay. okay let's say seven in the epilogue or something like that so um before the hellish chapters um but there, there's there are certain events um that just make the thing spiral out of control like it's just total madness for the last two chapters mm -hmm. all of the mary linton stuff ends before that Okay. She she leaves for the final time and you, you never see her again. That's that's <laughs> the final goodbye between her and Arthur. Um, so that that I think is a really important thing to note because Arthur sort of again, he he admits to himself who he is. He ad he admits that he has regrets and that he wished that he had turned his life around earlier. And then stuff starts to go to shit. And that's the moment when Arthur connects. That's to me, that's like the culmination of the true Arthur Morgan redemption. That's when it starts to become about his redemption. He's sick. He's dying. I mentioned that he dies at the end. Um, he does. He doesn't necessarily like go out in a blaze of glory. He gets fucking tuberculosis. Well, um, and he dies slowly, which is a really <laughs> son of a bitch thing to see happen in game. Like as his character starts to look sick and like when you brawl with people, like he's coughing and wheezing and like you, you start to lose fights because he's sick. Ugh. So like it's a it's a brutal way to see him go. Um, but yeah, like he's dying and he realizes that he, he should have lived a better life. But like the one thing that really sort of serves as the catalyst for his desire for redemption is is John and Abigail and Jack. Because in them, he sees the life that he and Mary Linton could have had. Mm -hmm. um, John is, um, you know, he's 
he, obviously he's younger than Arthur. He's not the youngest person in the group, but he falls sort of in the younger category. Um, and he's the only one that's kind of tried, right? Like um, the, uh, one of the sub <clears throat> one of the subplots is that um, John Marston had left the gang, like he just disappeared, quote unquote, for I don't know several months uh, with Abigail. I, th- I think did he? Yeah, I think he disappeared with Abigail and Jack, if I'm not mistaken. The, the idea was that Jack has tried to leave to go straight, and he couldn't, so he came back. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the other gang members, gang uh, members. Yes. So- <laughs> a lot of the Sorry. other gang gang members um, hold that over his head. Like, oh, you think you're better than the rest of us? You know, you tried to leave. You abandoned us, blah, blah, blah. And Arthur is kind of like that at first also. But I think because Arthur reconnects with Mary and because he finally admits to himself that he made a mistake himself not leaving the gang and having a life with her, he comes around on Jack and uh, sorry, on John and realizes, oh, he was right. He, he has been trying to do the right thing. He should leave the gang and he's young enough and Abigail's young enough and there's still time for Jack that this doesn't have to be their life. Um, also, side note, probably important to note, Jack at one point gets kidnapped. Uh, as a little kid, he gets kidnapped by a rival gang and you have to go on this big mission with the entire gang to go kill the shit out of the people who kidnapped little Jack. Mm -hmm. um great mission but also like a huge fucking should be a huge fucking eye opener right like you're an outlaw gang and you've got this little kid who's coming who who lives with the outlaw gang like this is horribly irresponsible you're putting this kid in tremendous danger like you have a responsibility as a parent to quit this life oh yeah um abigail starts to realize that jack is a little bit slower to. i'm sorry i keep saying jack and john john is a little bit slower to realize that but eventually arthur starts Arthur starts telling John, you need to leave this life. Like, don't make the same mistake that I made with Mary Linton. Don't don't think that this gang is really your family. I know that we've seemed like we're your family. But if we were really your family, essentially, like, we wouldn't be asking you to keep living this life and put your wife and child in danger. He's like, you're going to escape. So, so um, I'm trying to summarize, like, a, a series of complicated events. Essentially... <laughs> Essentially, again, towards the later chapters, you're st- you're you're doing the missions for the gang as Arthur, but you're also starting to do missions that are basically plotting John and Abigail and Jack's escape. Mm-hmm. Um, so eventually, like you're having to build up to the fact where they're going to take some money. Um, you know, basically, they end up taking the gang's money and just getting out of here. Um, the law is hunting you at every turn. Dutch is going crazy. There's new members of the gang that have come in that are not like the old members that Micah brought that are just like cutthroat killers. Like everything's going to shit. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I guess like I don't need to go into super detail on all of those plot events because they're not necessarily thematic. I guess the main thing you have to realize is that Arthur Morgan realized that he made a mistake and he doesn't want John to make that same mistake. Mm-hmm. Um, and John... Like John Marston knows it. I, I think th- I think that this is important to note, which is just that like John Marston's a smart guy. Arthur Morgan's a smart guy. Like they're kind of dumb hick outlaws, but they're not they're not quite like the other dumb outlaws. They're just they're just a <laughs> mite smarter, you know? They're a little uh-huh. they're a little clever. They're just clever enough. And I don't I don't say that to be pejorative. I say that because I honestly feel like I relate to that a little bit, right? Aww. Like I'm just smart enough to know how dumb I am. <laughs> like, and that's, and I say that in, in a self deprecating, like, humorous sort of way, but like, it's, it's an awful, powerful thing to, to be just smart enough to know how dumb you can be, right? Like, that's just mm-hmm. enough to sort of aim yourself in the right direction. So don't take it for granted. And like, that's John Marston. He, he, st- he starts to question Dutch because he sees the repetition of the mistakes that they're making, right? He sees this stupid pattern of, we're going to do a big job. And if we do a job that's big enough, we'll have enough money to run away and, and start a new life. And then we'll go straight. But if you do a job that's big enough, that means that the law is even more mad at you and they're willing to pursue you even further. Mm -hmm. So the bigger the job, the further the pursuit, and then you end up spending all that money as you're on the run. And then you need to do another job that's even bigger. And then the pursuit gets even more intense. And it's, it's stupid. It doesn't make any sense. Um, And John, John is smart enough to start to realize this. And he's also smart enough to realize that, that like, like he realizes the game is rigged and it's all sort of propped up on Dutch's ego. And and if you were really smart, you would just cut and run, basically. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so that's what ends up happening. And again, without summarizing all the details of the plot of the of the last chapters, Arthur dies. Um, he he basically does sacrifice himself, sort of holding the line, quote unquote, so that Abigail and John and Jack can escape, which they do. Um, Dutch survives um, because Dutch Dutch is alive even in Red Dead Redemption One. Um, that's like way 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 down the line before he finally meets his end. Um, but John and Abigail and Jack escape, and they end. The, and at the end of the last chapter, uh, they're basically just running off. And the epilogue is eight years into the future or something like that. Mm-hmm. I think it's something like it. So yeah. So Jack is, I guess, maybe like an early teenager. John and Abigail have kind of made a life for themselves. It's not bad. It's it hasn't been like a storybook ending for them. Like they've kind of gotten by being straight. You know, not really committing crimes, but it's hard for them to make a living. And every few, you know, every couple of years or every several months, John gets into some kind of trouble. He gets into a fight. You know, it wasn't his fault, but he ended up killing some guy. And like, they got to move to a new, they got to move to a new town. Like, this is just a pattern that keeps repeating. Um, and Abigail is starting to get fed up again. Like, y- like you said that we were going to go straight and we're kind of doing that, but you keep messing up and like, we need to put down roots somewhere. Like if, if I'm going to stay and we're going to build a life and Jack's going to be able to grow up into a proper person, like you need to take this more seriously. Um, and so eventually he does. And the epilogue, which so many people complain about, like at least the first part of it largely consists of John uh, taking a job at a farm uh-huh. at a local farm. And literally the gameplay sequence becomes like, go milk this cow. And you like press a to milk the cow. Like, <laughs> go build this fence and like you have to like do a little quick time event and tap the hammer and like put the post and the you know like and it's like a lot of that like there's a couple hours of that and like go round up cattle and go into town and and pick up the supplies and like some people were really sort of incensed that that was the gameplay but i thought that was brilliant from a thematic standpoint because it puts the player into an empathic state where yes you're bored that's the point Now you feel the sacrifice of putting away ultimate freedom and a life on the run and a life as a rebel where you get to take what you want and, you know, um, you know, take what you want and give nothing back. That sort of exciting lifestyle for a more mundane lifestyle that is safer and better for your family. Right. Like I thought that that was an actually an ingenious way to sort of hook players emotions into that thematic element through what is inarguably boring gameplay. Um, Because now you understand it at least a little tiny bit on that level. Um, <clears throat> so you do that. Um, the storyline progresses. Um, again, yada, yada. John John finally gets the idea of I'll take out a loan, right? I'll get a loan so that I can so that I can build this house. And he, he hears about property. There's a little, um, it was actually Abigail's idea. She said it as more of like a, you know, like a wistful desire. One day, maybe we could buy our own little little patch of land and we could have a small little farm. And she mentions this place that's outside of uh, Blackwater. And at first, John's like, yeah, like we can't afford, you know, even if it is a small place, like don't don't even bring that up. Like we can't afford that. Um, oh, and then sorry, sorry. He John gets wrapped up in a situation where the farm that he's working for gets attacked by another farm but that farm is like clearly also a front for more outlaws and they're like intimidating and they they try and burn down the farm you're working at and so in order to help the man who gave you a chance and gave you a job john's like all right i'll handle these people well he goes over there and fucking kills all they're bad guys they tried they tried to burn down the farm but he fucking kills everybody (laughs) uh and abigail's like what the fuck dude i told you don't do this again so she leaves she takes jack and she leaves she's like i'm done with this shit like i told you to stop doing this and you didn't stop doing this so i'm fucking gone Mm -hmm. so john gets the idea that the only way my last chance to prove to abigail that i that i am a changed man and that i do truly want to have settle down roots and have a life with her is to is to go get her that farm that she talked about like he finds the little flyer or whatever that she had and he's like okay it's outside blackwater it's this much money there's no fucking way I have that much money. I'll, I've never had that. I've never had that much money unless I've stolen it. Um, I, I, I'll get a loan. And so he convinces the man who works for him, you know, because you did technically just save his farm by fighting off the bad guys. Like, can you vouch for me at the bank? Um, and he's like, you know what? Like, I see what you're trying to do. Like, uh, you've been working for me for these many months. Like, I'll tell I will vouch for you at the bank. I'll tell him you're a good man and an honest employee. And holy shit, Katie, back in the West, apparently that helped. <laughs> Yeah, man, I wish it was that easy now. <laughs> just, just get your boss to vouch for you at the bank, and they give you a loan. 
Um, so yeah, he does this. Um, that scene in and of itself is a really cool scene. Um, I don't want to take credit for this observation. There's a guy who I really, really like on YouTube called Noah um, Caldwell Gervais or, or Gervais Caldwell. I can't remember. I never remember which. He's the one who first pointed out the fact that like that scene is like a real, um, it condenses sort of the 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 metamorphosis of John Marston like it's one of those scenes where um the scene of it is just so different because you can't control dialogue options like you don't get to control what these characters say like you do in a Bioware game mm-hmm. and so watching John Marston like walk into the office of this bank manager and say please sir I need a loan and like I I just want to build something for my family and like he's at the mercy of the type of person that he's been robbing the whole game mm-hmm like, it's it's not accidental that you do bank robberies in Red Dead Redemption 2. That's like a back-of-the-box bullet point feature, is that there's a whole system for how you do bank robberies, and, like, the longer you stay in the bank, you know, you can steal more money, but the cops are coming, and you can either crack the safe or use dynamite. Like, it's a gameplay feature of how you rob banks, the bank robbing system in Red Dead Redemption. Mm-hmm. And yet, the, the really one of the crucial story moments in the redemptive part of the game is John Marston walking into a bank and asking, please, sir, can I have a loan? Mm-hmm. Like, that's, that's um, and, and the player doesn't, you know, doesn't have any control in that sense because it stops being about, it stops being a power fantasy. It stops being a power fantasy where you can go and take what you want. And it starts being a lesson about how to take responsibility and be a goddamn human being in society and follow the rules and do what you have to do because there are no shortcuts. And if you try and just keep John Marston knows that if he steals the money to build the house that's supposed to prove to Abigail that he's not a criminal anymore, that that's a contradiction on its face. Mm-hmm. Right. He fi- and it's it's not I'm, I'm talking a lot about the male perspective, but it's not. We shouldn't escape the fact that if it's not for Mary Linton and if it wasn't for Abigail, these two knuckleheads never would have figured it out. Yeah. Right? Like, it's a very important thing that a lot of young men, myself included, don't necessarily want to accept, which is that a woman, a female, sort of has to set a standard for you to mature into as a man. It's a really uncomfortable and tough subject for a lot of young men, and they, most of us uh, rebel against it pretty hard, but it also seems to be sort of inescapable in life that a, that a, quote unquote good woman uh will set a standard for you to mature towards Mm -hmm. you don't see a lot of that in modern day media aimed at young men you don't no like that's a very (laughs) rare thing that seems to escape from all of this power fantasy and wish fulfillment that we're being fed as young men and so and so john gets the loan um and and he starts to build his house and this leads us to one of the fucking most incredible like viral successes of anything i have ever seen which is a goddamn musical montage of John Marston building his house. And it's, (laughs) it's uncle. Who's a character who is, he was like this, they called him uncle because he's like this dopey old guy who's like part of the gang and he's sort of an outlaw, but he's kind of hapless, but he's a sweetheart. Mm -hmm. And he ended up hanging around with John because after the gang broke up, he didn't have anywhere else to go. Uh, And also Charles, who's a half African American, half native American. And, uh, Charles is a whole nother topic that I would have to talk about separately, but goddamn, Charles has got a heart of gold also. Good guy. Mm -hmm. And so it's Charles and Uncle and John building this house. And I swear to God, I like I'm I'm not gonna sing the song, but you can look it up if you're ever curious. It's the it's the most hokey, like happy go lucky, like we're building a house, like look at us. Like it's the most optimistic, like saccharine and Katie. I cannot explain to you the level of popularity of this scene. Like, uh-huh. you would think that in a game about being an outlaw and shooting people up and, and fuck the law and I can do whatever I want, that this would be the most, like, ev- even people who hate the, the, the epilogue love this scene. It has been reposted so many times and remixed and people have made so many memes about it and just people love it. It's optimistic. <laughs> it's this optimistic view of like by the sweat of your brow and like elbow grease and like you can build a life for yourself up out of the dirt and it's it's portrayed in the most positive like old world fucking 1950s aesthetics and values and like 2018 people loved it they fell all over themselves loving it and i was i was shocked by that because when i watched it i kind of loved it too but i thought oh my god people are gonna make fun of this it's gonna be so hokey like it is hokey but people adore that scene well, I think there's also maybe an element of like, especially our generation. I don't know so much about like current seventeen-year-olds, but like, 
and maybe it's just me and Michael and people I know, I don't know about you, but like we were taught like, oh, just work hard, get the good grades, go to college, everything will be fine. Hey, guess what didn't happen? Yeah, two economic <laughs> crashes later. Yeah. <laughs> the housing market crash, like just his whole thing. Like, like yeah, we, we at every major turning point in our lives, there has been something terrible going on. And like, no matter how hard we've worked, no matter how hard whatever, like, we don't get the house. We can't, like, y- y- like nowadays, like, good luck getting that loan to go build the house or whatever. And, like, a lot of us, like, we don't have the skills. No one taught us how to do carpentry and stuff like that. Right. And and houses are so much more complicated to build and there's permits and, like, actual, who, who knows how to do electricity. Like, it's a lot more complicated. So, yeah, I can see how, like, just the simplicity of, like fuck it, I don't need a computer, I don't need all this debt I have, I'm just going to go into the woods and build a goddamn log cabin, like how that, yeah. and sing a hokey song, like I, I can see <laughs> a lot of people like would like that. It's quaint, you know, it's funny, as you were saying that, it just sort of revealed something to me, which is that I was saying that about the bank scene at least, that it stopped being wish fulfillment, but in a weird way, it kind of comes back to wish fulfillment, mm-hmm. when you say that, right, like, um. so yeah, like I, I was amazed by that scene, and so, you build the house. Um, John finds Abigail again. And he says, come come to outside of Blackwater, like, see what I've built. And she, she does. And she's just like, you know, she's mad at him and shit. Like, why the hell did it take you this long? But eventually she's like, yes, this is what I wanted. She moves back in. Je- he starts to raise Jack. And um, it, I, I want to say, like, that's a good place to stop the story. Like, he did it. He built the house. Like, he, he, mm-hmm. he she came back. They are happy. It is kind of a happy ending, quote unquote. Um, but it doesn't feel entirely complete to leave it there. So I know we're kind of at about 30 minutes. Um, I'll, I'll see if I can wrap up here somewhat quickly because I think it's really important to note this final bit. Red Dead Redemption 2 is a prequel. Um, Red Dead Redemption 1 is how the story um, in chronological order actually ends. So I'm now gonna I'm now gonna spoil the ending of Red Dead Redemption 1 also. Uh, so sorry everybody, but I think it's really important. <laughs> Um, John Marston dies at the end of Red Dead Redemption 1. Um, um, and, and Red Dead Redemption 1 is only like three years after Red Dead Redemption 2. Um, again, I can't take full credit for these observations. Um, Noah, again, Noah Caldwell Gervais, um, Gervais Caldwell, I can never remember. He's got like a four hour video on the entire Red Dead Redemption franchise. I highly recommend people go watch it. It, it influenced, I had a lot of my own thoughts about Red Dead. His work tremendously influenced me even further. Um, and I think he made a very salient point about this connection, right? Which is that you could make the mistake of thinking like, because we already know that John Marston's going to die in Red Dead Redemption 1, what's the point? Right? Like, can it really be a happy ending if we already know that like Marston's not going to make it at the end of, at the end of one? And he says what I think is I, uh, one of the most important things, which is just that like, and I'm going to do a crap job of summarizing this, but it's essentially that. Life is hard, and sometimes it can be brutally hard, and we should not necessarily, and I'm paraphrasing, this is not what Noah says, this is kind of more what I'm saying I feel after having watched his videos. It's like, life is hard, and we shouldn't necessarily operate from the standpoint that good stuff in life is the default, and bad stuff is just sort of like an aberration and an injustice. It, it If you look at reality, it might be more sobering and more honest to just say that like life is hard and we have to fight and scrap for whatever good parts of it we can possibly make. And, and the fact that it's going to end somewhat unhappily is not a reason to give up. It's a reason to fight all the harder because if all you get is three and a half happy years with your family, then God damn it, fight for those three years. Yeah. Because life is so hard and so brutal. That might be all you have. So like, Pick it, pick up your shit and do everything you can to make the most out of life. And I think that's an astonishing observation, right? Like if you put the entirety of the Red Dead saga together, that's basically what it's saying to young men. Stop dicking around. Stop acting like you can do whatever you want. Stop reveling in the enjoyment of your own freedom and saying, fuck the man and nobody can tell me what to do assume responsibility for someone that you love and for yourself not just because society tells you you have to but assume Mm. responsibility for your own life and a person that you love and go sacrifice everything even your freedom for yourself and that person and your children and your future Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. 
that's a fucking astounding message in a game that on the surface seems like a shooty shooty pew pew cowboy game. <laughs> no, you're right. Yeah. I there's also like an element that like a lot of um there's a lot of loneliness right now in the world. So I imagine like a lot of people like finish that game and go, "I want to do that. I have no one to do that with." Oh, fuck me. Like mm. you know, I imagine that would be like a really sobering moment, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> Like, I've been lucky, like, as soon as I left my parents' house, like, I met Michael. Like, and I've been with him since I was 18. Like, I, I have not known an adult life without him. So I, I'm lucky in that sense. But, like, a lot of my friends, like, uh, they, like, a, a lot of good friends of mine, like, have been single, like, for a very long time now. And they, they want to have that life. They want to do that. They want to start. Some of, them, some of them are even in a financial position to be able to do that. But they can't do that, you know? <laughs> so, like, it's, I don't know. This is a little maybe off topic now. But, like. It's it's one of those. There's so many elements to this that I I it's. I don't know. I just. I am not in this position to like feel this way, but I feel bad for people that do. And I guess this is me describing that. <laughs> no, you're on the right track. I think you're saying yeah. exactly the right thing. Yeah. So like I, 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 there's probably like an element here where, you it, this doesn't necessarily have to be about a significant other. This could be about. Um, like a good friend, maybe like if your parents are ill and you, you want to help them out, it could be about your parents or a sibling, um, a found family. Like, I feel like there, it doesn't have to be necessarily romantic or a, a child relationship. Like maybe you just really f- fucking like your cat. I don't know. Like, it- <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, holy crap. I, I cannot even understate. I am so glad you just said that because I, <laughs> I, I was going to forget a very important part of what I love about this whole saga that I just described. You just nailed it. What? And 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 Red Dead does not forget what you just said, right? Uh-huh. Because Arthur Morgan doesn't ever get a happy ending with Mary Linton. He doesn't That's true. Get, he doesn't get to settle down and have a house and kids, and he knows that. So instead, what he does is, like you said, it could be a friend, it could be supporting someone else, it could. But the point is, sacrifice for somebody else. Yeah. Right. Like that was the thing, which is like, even if you're not in the position of John Marston, you might be in the position of Arthur Morgan, where you can fight for your friends and like helping your your like you said, your found family, your community be better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a beautiful it's a beautiful thing. It doesn't leave yeah. people out. It, it, what it desperately tries to I what I think it just desperately trying to say is don't quit. Like, don't give up on life and just say, well, I'm just going to be an outlaw and just <laughs> revel against <laughs> everything. Like, you know, it acknowledges that there's a portion of your life that even if you're not a literal outlaw, we all sort of go through sort of a rebellious stage, most likely when we're young, um, but that you should come out of that and, and sort of come out of that, um, come out of it with sort of a firsthand knowledge that while it's fun, it doesn't work. Yeah. There, there's no ending to it. It's there just- isn't. It just ends. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. And it can either end because it sputters out and you're, you're sort of left with nothing or it can end because you make a choice to sort of transition into a different stage of your life. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's my TED Talk, everybody. <laughs> well, bravo. This is, this is again, I feel like the, some of the baby episodes are getting like real serious. <laughs> uh, I, look, I, I, tw- I tweeted out the, the other day that I said, I think the Sailor Moon episode is going to be one of the best ones ever, which by this point, by the time this one comes out, the Sailor Moon one will have already been out. So we'll see if people uh-huh. agree with that, but. Yeah, well, so well, well, then this is the next contender. So, we whatever the next thing we should do is just maybe just like talking bullshit for thirty minutes. That way, people like this year's already been so serious that like we <laughs> we gotta just uh-huh. talk about some. Yeah, stupid. you're not kidding. Uh, but anyway, I think that's it. Any other any other thoughts before we close? No, uh, it's like I, I I I've been trying to get Michael to play the game because I feel like that's something that he want to do. But uh, yeah, I, I think it's one of those like now hearing more about the plot. I'm like, oh, that's just. What Michael's poor Michael's trying to do right now? I don't <laughs> <laughs> Michael's on a mission. Yeah, he, he'd be sitting there watching the montage. Like that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, don't we all? Um, yeah. All right, Katie. I guess uh, where can the folks find you? Uh, well, uh, right now I'm probably gone. So good luck with that. But uh, you can find my YouTube channel at Gilder Thalen, and then same username on Twitter. Um, I don't know when we'll I'll be back, but <laughs> so at some point. Anyway, where can they find you, Jordan? Uh, they can find me at the Exalted March on YouTube, Instagram, uh, Reddit, and Twitter. All right, and with that, everyone, uh, Dutch, we need more money. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, we need I more money, Dutch. <laughs> we don't have enough money. <laughs> I'm ending money. it there. That's the end. <laughs>